So let's talk about believing God's word, because obviously this is an important issue, because today 85% of Christian-raised children leave the church by the age of 20. That's 17 out of every 20. It's a big issue, my friends. In fact, this uh, Darwinian biologist from Harvard and world-renowned atheist stated, the revolution against Christianity began when it became obvious the earth was ancient rather than having been created 6,000 years ago. He went on to state this finding, old earth beliefs, which only came about 200 years ago and didn't become popular until 150 years ago, was the finding was the snowball that started the whole avalanche. The age of the earth is the whole foundational issue, my friends. It's very important. Jesus said, he warned us, take heed that no man deceives you. So I'm going to try to brainwash everybody. Is that okay? <laughs> Pastor Will sort of gave an okay. Now, it's only going to take a minute, and then I'm going to unbrainwash you. But I want to show you how easy it is to be misled. So don't say, if you know the answer, don't say this out loud. I want everyone to think about this. It's going to make an important point. What would you do in this person's position? A man left home jogging, and he jogged for a little ways, and he turned left, and he jogged a bit further, turned left, and he jogged further, turned left, and jogged back toward home. But as he was jogging home, he noticed there were two masked men ahead waiting for him. So what would you do? What should he do? I mean, would you turn and run the other way, yell for help, dial 911? What would you do? And here's the point I want to make. If your first thought was wrong, all of your following thoughts were way off base. You have been misled. So let me unbrainwash you. A man left home jogging, and he jogged for a little ways, and he turned left, and he jogged further, and he turned left, and he jogged further, turned left, and jogged back toward home. But as he was jogging home, he noticed that there were two masked men ahead waiting for him. <laughs> a catcher and an umpire. So what should he do? He should slide, right? But if your first thought was wrong, you were way out in left field. You were completely misled on all of your following thoughts. Well, you know, for the fact of the matter is, you can tell a six-year-old anything, and they're going to believe you, as they should be able to. But for the past hundred or so years, we've been teaching our six-year-olds that Earth formed four and a half billion years ago, and the evidence certifies this. The evidence certifies the earth is billions of years old and death existed before man, does it? Well, just in case these old earth beliefs aren't quite as certified as they promote, let me show you where the old earth beliefs come from and how they're derived. You've probably heard of carbon dating. It's used on organic remains. Now, the process of uh, uh, carbon-14 is what they measure, and it's, it's manufactured in the atmosphere. Well, during the process of photosynthesis, plants breathe in CO2 that contain trace amounts of carbon-14, which becomes a part of their tissue. Now, when an animal eats a plant or breathes, they get carbon-14 in them. We all have trace amounts of carbon-14 in us. But carbon-14 decays away over time. And when a plant or an animal dies, it stops eating and breathing. At least, that's always been my observation. <laughs> well, carbon-14 should decay away in measurable amounts in less than 80,000 years. Now, since they think the amount in the atmosphere is somewhat e in equilibrium, not changing a great deal, they compare the amount in the ground that's been decaying away to the amount in the atmosphere, and they, since the less carbon-14 in the organic remain, the older it's going to date, because it's decaying away. But they can only go to about 80,000 years max because the carbon-14 would be gone. So if someone tells you they carbon dated something a you know, million years or you know, whatever above 80,000 years, you know they have no clue what they're talking about. However, the assumption that the amount in the atmosphere is the same has proven greatly erroneous because the amount in the atmosphere changes quite often. In fact, living penguins were dated 8,000 years old. Living snails dated 27,000 years old. Uh, this from the Anthropological Journal of Canada. The troubles of the carbon dating method are undeniably deep and serious. Half of the dates are rejected. There are gross discrepancies. And the accepted dates, the published dates, they're actually selected dates. Selected dates? 
You mean they just pick a date they want? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, where do they pick it from? We'll get to that in just a minute. Let's talk about um, potassium argon dating. Most of the isotope dating method, methods, the radiometric dating methods, are used on igneous rock. They think the melting process sets the age back to zero from an isotope standpoint. There's about 40 different methods. They all work the same. It's, it's uh, actually a, not a, a measurement of time, but of radioactive decay. Well, potassium-40 decays into argon-40. That's a scientific fact. And it's a scientific fact. We have the equipment to grind up a rock and measure the amount of potassium and the amount of argon in the rock. That's a fact. It's even a scientific fact. We can measure the rate of decay from potassium to argon at, in today's rate. And that's where the science ends and the wild guesses begin, which corrupt the integrity. They don't call them wild guesses. They call them assumptions. Let me show you a few of the assumptions they make to come up with old Earth beliefs. They have to assume, since their potassium decays into argon, they're really measuring the amount of argon and saying it took this long to form, right? Well, aren't they assuming there was no argon in the rock when the rock formed? I mean, if there was already argon there when the rock formed, it's going to date millions or billions of years older than it is, right? They have to assume their rock laid there for their millions or billions of years and was never contaminated with potassium or argon. I mean, or argon's a gas. It can pass from one rock to the next fairly easily. Pressure, heat, earthquakes, water running over rocks can cause contamination. They weren't there to watch the rock for their millions or billions of years, so they have to assume no contamination ever took place. They assume that the decay rate we observe today has always been the same, and more and more studies are showing it used to be quicker or faster in the past. And of course, they assume God had nothing to do with anything, which biases the method before it even starts. Now, if any one of those guesses is wrong, and the odds are they are all wrong, their dates are going to be off by millions or billions of years. For instance, rocks that we know formed in a Hawaiian lava flow 200 years ago were sent to 12 labs for dating. Well, the youngest age came back at 325 million years old. The oldest came in at 3 billion years old. So let me ask you a question. Where do they get the 4.6 billion year age that they certify the earth to be? from dating meteorites. And they don't know when or where meteorites formed. The interesting thing about meteorites, they're only found in the top few strata layers. Well, wait a minute. If, if those layer formed and laid there exposed for millions of years before the next layer formed, and on and on you go up through the, the column there, shouldn't there be meteorites throughout all the layers, even more in the lower layers? Why are they only found in the top few layers? because those sedimentary layers laid down by water were laid down by, <clears throat> well, um, water <laughs> in the global flood. And only the top few layers have been exposed to meteorite impact. So bad dates are the rule when they use the radiometric dating techniques, but they'll date a rock over and over until they get a good date to select. Well, what is a good date? Where does it come from? It's selected from matching the man-made geologic column or time scale. This is important to understand. This is where the old earth beliefs are derived from. Not from some scientific isotope dating method. They're derived from the geologic column or time scale. Now this was put together in the early 1800s, shortly after George Washington passed away, when a modern mu uh, weapon was a musket, when they thought a cell was a, sing a simple gelatin-like glob of substance. It's unbelievably complex we know today, beyond human comprehension complex. Well, so where did, you know, what they did was they gave, they made a drawing of 12 primary layers, and they gave an age to each layer, and a name, and assigned index fossils, like this fish that the arrow is pointing to. The index fossil, the story with the index fossil is that that creature went extinct while that layer was forming over millions of years of time. Now, since he was extinct, he wouldn't be found in the newer layers that formed above because he was extinct, right? So, any time you find an index fossil in a layer, everything in the layer is given the age they assigned the layer. Well, let me ask you a question. Where did they come up with the ages of the layers back in the early 1800s 
Where did they come up with the ages? Well, they made them up. Where else could they have come up with them, right? And the isotope dating methods have to match the column before they get published. This is where the dates come from. In fact, this textbook tells kids on page 306 we date the rock by the fossils found in it. Okay, but, but where do you come up with the age of the fossil? Well, it says on page 307, we date the fossil by the rock it's found in. <laughs> we date the rock by the fossil and the fossil by the rock. They've got a total circular argument going here. For instance, low-thin fish were indexed fossils for rock up to 325 million years old. That's five times as long as they say dinosaurs have been extinct. We're going to talk about dinosaurs in the next message. For, so any rock layer found with a low-thin fossil in it, and everything in that layer was dated up to 325 million years old. Except the low-thin fish has been found alive today. <laughs> Not extinct, 325 million years old. Which means those layers with the low-thin fossils in it could have just been a few years old, right? And, and let's be as fair as possible, because I did say there's two ways to interpret the evidence depending on which worldview you look at it through. See, I look at this uh, picture of the low fin fish, and I say that refutes the older dating methods. Or you could believe that scuba diver is 325 million years old. <laughs> You're going to have to choose for yourself which to believe. I think logically it's pretty obvious which worldview fits the evidence. In fact, their index fossils, which the old earth beliefs are based upon, have become a complete embarrassment to old earth believers. In fact, they're showing up alive today by the dozens. Like the Wolomi pine tree, which was an index fossil for rock 150 million years old, it's been found alive today in three different locations. Not extinct 150 million years. They're showing up alive today so often they've had to come up with a scientific classification for the index fossils being found alive. They call them Lazarus Taxon because they've risen from the dead. <laughs> but my friends, they never were extinct. All those sedimentary layers laid down by water were laid down in the global flood, just like the biblical worldview holds. So it's important to understand the geologic column is where the old earth beliefs are derived from. And that's very important for you to understand because the correct order of those 12 primary layers with the corresponding index fossils by which they date them have only been found in that correct order two places in the entire world. School textbooks and museum displays. <laughs> Other than in these two man-made instances, in the real world, the column doesn't exist. Even Old Earth faithful only claim it exists in one half of 1% of the Earth's surface. But in those places where you do find 12 layers, they don't find the corresponding index fossils, which actually make up the column. So it does not exist in reality. You know, the Bible says my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So let's take a look at a global flood theory. Let's take a look at the world through a biblical worldview. Now, God had shut Noah and the animals safely on board the ark. We're going to talk about this in the next message. Now, the same day, the fountains of the great deep were broken up. Most people think the flood water came from above. Uh, some of it did, but most of it came from below when the fountains of the deep erupted. And the earth's crust split apart around the globe as these fountains of the deep erupted, shooting scalding hot waters, muds, and magma into the atmosphere, producing torrential rainfalls. This is a map of the world fault lines around the globe. There are 50,000 miles of these fault lines crisscrossing the globe, like San Andreas Fault, which I think are just scars left over from where the fountains of the deep erupted. Well, the raging fountains brought down the water above the firmament. Now, there's a lot of speculation on what the water above the firmament was. It was destroyed in the flood. It's not there to test, study, and observe today. So I'm not going to get into the theories, but the fountains destroyed the water above the firmament. And the Bible says the windows of heaven were opened. A window is something you could see through. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights as the windows of heaven came down. Now the flood lasted almost a year. It only rained down the windows of heaven 40 days and 40 nights. And from the start of the flood, the land mass began to split apart where the fountains of the deep were 
exploding and, and dividing the continent up into pieces. The upperly ex, uh, exploding waters were eroding the edges of the crack, producing a muddy flow around the globe, and plants and animals were being drowned and buried in sedimentary layers stratified by the moving waters so quickly they didn't have time to rot away or get eaten by scavengers to preserve them as our fossil record we find today. Now, textbooks teach kids that fossils take millions of years to form. Well, let me ask you a question. Who's ever seen a fossil form over millions of years of time? Nobody. That's a belief. Now, if I can show you one thing that's turned to stone in less than a million years, I've scientifically debunked that teaching, correct? Here's a water wheel that turned to solid stone in just 65 years due to the minerals running through the water going across it. A miner left his hat in a New Zealand mine and came back about 50 years later, the, the hat had turned to stone. Is 50 years and a million years, is that the same thing? <laughs> no. I can show you dozens of things that have petrified or fossilized quickly. So we've debunked that old earth belief. The fact of the matter is things must be buried quickly to be preserved as fossils. If they lay on the surface, they rot away or get eaten by scavengers. I like this ichosaur that was buried while giving birth. Obviously, something very sudden and catastrophic took place. Over the last five years, more than three dozen dinosaur bones have been found that are not fossilized, that still have red blood cells and soft, flexible tissues in them. Oh, yeah, we're going to cover this in the next message. There's no reason to believe in millions and billions of years of time that put death before Adam. Polystrata fossils are some of my favorite fossils to show folks. Polystrata fossils traverse multiple strata layers, like these trees. Some are upside down, going through multiple strata layers. Well, I thought each layer formed over millions of years. Well, we're supposed to believe a tree turned itself upside down and balanced there for millions of years, waiting for strata to build up around it? It didn't fall over. It didn't rot away. It doesn't make any sense. But I say during the flood, trees got uprooted and they floated horizontally on the surface until they waterlogged and the heavier end turned and it floated in that upright position until it waterlogged the point it sank to the bottom, sitting against the bottom in that upright position as the flood laid down layer after layer after layer, forming polystrata fossils. You know, clams and trilobites are found in the lowest layers, so evolutionists say they're the first things to have evolved. Well, the trilobite has the most complex eye design known with 15,000 lenses. That was the first thing to have evolved? Didn't clams and trilobites live at the bottom of the ocean? Wouldn't they be the first things buried as those hot muds and magma were flowing from the fountains of the deep? Yeah, they're found in the bottom because they lived at the bottom. Yeah, have you ever tried to talk to a clam? <laughs> I have. They just clam up on you. <laughs> My wife says, don't go there. <laughs> but, you know, what would you do if you warned them, hey, there's going to be a flood, you need to get out of here, where were they going to go, right? Of course they're at the bottom. They lived at the bottom. In fact, about 10 years ago in China, they found a fossilized fish in the bottom of the Cambrian. Well, what's the deal with that? The fish is only an inch long, about the size of a minnow. So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that evolutionists say only single-cell creatures lived at this time. The fish has gills, a central nervous system, etc. It doesn't give evolution time to have taken place. Think about the situation. It had the atheist, communist, Chinese scientists calling the American scientists closed-minded bigots because they wouldn't consider the fact we just might have been created. In fact, the lead Chinese scientist stated in frustration, in China, we can criticize Darwin, but not the government. In America, you can criticize your government, but not Darwin. <laughs> now, we talked about carbon dating and how the carbon-14 will be gone in less than 80,000 years. Think about this. Recent studies have found carbon-14 exists in all the fossil-bearing layers, down to the bottom of the Cambrian, which we are told are 580 million years old. It means they can only be a few thousand years old. Oh, and better yet, from a biblical standpoint, the amount of carbon-14, remember it decays away over time, 
it's in the same range of amount from the top layer all the way through the bottom layer. Which means what? All those sedimentary layers laid down by water formed in the same event. And nothing but a global flood can explain that, my friends. You know, kids are taught coal layers form over millions of years of time. Coal is usually found, there's a layer of coal, then a layer of strata, a layer of coal, a layer of strata, and on and on it goes. And the story is, well, the, the whole area sank down and water rushed in and formed a swamp, and peat formed at the bottom, and then the whole layer over, you know, millions of years, uplifted and the water ran off, and the peat just laid there. I mean, it didn't rot away. It didn't get hit by lightning and start on fire or anything. And then the, a strata layer formed above the layer of coal, and then it sank down, and swamp came in. And up and down it goes, forming coal layer, strata layer, coal layer, strata layer, over hundreds of millions of years of time. But how do they explain branching coal seams? Where a branch of coal goes from the lower layer through the strata layer above into the coal layer above. If this formed over millions of years of time, that doesn't make any sense. Now let's look at this through a biblical worldview. During the flood, plants were uprooted and they floated together in huge mats of vegetation that were floating around on the surface of the water. They were raining organic debris to the bottom that were quickly being buried by following sediments to form a future layer of coal with a strata layer above. But eventually, the, the winds or the tides turned, and they retraced their steps, laying down another layer of coal with strata layers in between. But at the point of turn, you have branching coal seams connecting the lower layer through the strata layer above into the coal layer above. That fits perfectly with the biblical worldview. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> Pastor Will, it's almost like God's word is true or something, you know? <laughs> Word for word and cover to cover, my friends. When we compromise God's word with secular beliefs, that's our mistake, not God's mistake. In fact, the U.S. Department of Energy gave coal samples for testing, and coal from three layers representing hundreds of millions of years of time all still have carbon-14 in them. We're taught stalactites and stalagmites form over millions of years of time. Well, nobody's ever seen that take place, right? Yeah, we have man-made structures all over the place where they have to go in like to, to dam tunnels every year and break these, these things off so they don't block up the dams. Here's a bat that died on top of one and was covered in flowstone before it could even rot away. You know, right at the end of the flood, all those moist layers with all the water running through them would have formed stalactites and stalagmites very quickly in a matter of days. Not millions of years of time like they might form in some caves at today's rate. Or whirlpools were depositing piles of plants and animals to form today's oil and natural gas deposits and fossil graveyards. You've heard of fossil graveyards where various creatures are, are buried together in a small area. Sometimes their bones intertwined. Well, we don't see animals traveling for thousands of miles to die in big piles on each other today. And even if they did, they'd rot away or get eaten by scavengers. But during the flood, dead bodies got caught up in whirlpools, sometimes mixing their bones together and burying them in the same place very quickly. Not over millions of years of time. Did you know that never have oil or natural gas deposits been found that do not contain carbon-14, which should have been gone in less than 80,000 years? In fact, this scientific journal said such a finding would argue the entire physical Earth must have had a recent origin. Yeah, no duh. Well, the scalding hot waters of the fountains led to the Ice Age effects. You know, kids are taught today that the Ice Age formed the ice caps during a cooling cycle of the Earth. I say that makes no sense whatsoever. Let me explain how the ice caps formed. The scalding hot waters of the fountains had erupted, and it warmed up the oceans. It's estimated that the flood waters averaged 90 degrees Fahrenheit which led to massive evaporation that was raining down over the equators and snowing down over the poles, forming today's ice caps. So this is how the ice caps form, not, not in a cooling cycle. I say a cooling cycle makes no sense. I mean, if the ice caps formed in a cooling cycle, wouldn't a cooling cycle cool down the oceans? Wouldn't that end evaporation? So how'd the water get to the poles? No, it takes warm oceans to lead to the ice caps. 
The global flood, my friends, the global flood. Now, near the end of the flood, the earth's fractured plates slid apart violently. We're taught about continental drift and Pangea and how the, the continents appear to fit together and, and how they, they seem to be moving maybe a half inch a year. We don't even know. They might just be rocking back and forth. But here's how continental drift fits with the biblical worldview, and there's argument over whether continental drift actually took place or not. But the Bible says toward the end of the flood, the waters rushed up by the mountains and down into the valleys. I think what happened was the thin plates that were over the fountains of the deep in the original creation gave way. They collapsed, jutting mountains upward and forming the ocean basins that we have today. And when this massive tectonic event took place, that means the earth's plates, tectonic, took place, the waters rushed down in the oceans and sloshed back up against the mountains, and for a couple of months they sloshed back and forth, laying down strata layer after strata layer, and the last time they ran off, they left most of the Earth's geological features behind that we see today. I live in Flagstaff, Arizona, 7,000 feet above sea level. I can show you shark's teeth and trilobite fossils and sponge fossils all around Flagstaff. The world's tallest mountains, like Mount Everest, littered with seashells on the tops. They were vaulted there when the mountains arose and the valleys sank down. Here's a Northern Arizona University textbook designed to mislead your children. They have an accredited class there attacking me because I spoke there for 45 minutes five years ago. Is their position really that weak? Yeah. In fact, the, the message I do today at 5 is the message that launched that class. But this, this textbook says, kids, kids, clams would have needed far longer than the 40-day duration of the biblical flood to move up a steep mountainside. Well, I agree with that. I mean, clams would need a lot longer than 40 days to climb up a mountain. <laughs> but they climbed nowhere. They were vaulted there when the mountains arose and the valley sank down. And if they're going to try to attack the Word of God, they can at least have a clue as to what the Word of God says. The flood lasted over 300 days. It only rained down the windows of heaven 40 days and 40 nights. Well, textbooks correctly teach you can't bend rock. If you try to bend a piece of shale, it's going to snap, right? Yet we find geologic compression events like this around the globe where hundreds of feet of finely stratified layers are squished together like an accordion with up to 160-degree bends in the rock. But the rock's not broken. How do you bend rock like this without breaking it? Now, the secularists are going to say... The whole area was subducted and superheated, and that's when the folding took place. Well, there's a lot of problems with that. I'll just point out one major one. If you superheat sedimentary layers of rock so it can fold like that, there are no longer sedimentary layers of rock. They're, they would turn into metamorphic rock. And these are not metamorphic, they're sedimentary. What happened was these were still mud layers at the end of the flood when this massive tectonic event took place. The mountains arose, the valley sank down, any continental drift that took place split apart during that time. And when they stopped, you have geologic compression events where the layers are folded, yet not broken, because they were still moist mud at the time. Well, the runoff eroded canyons in the soft sediments. You know, we're told today that the Colorado River dug out Grand Canyon over millions of years of time. Now, I lead Christian-based bus trips to the rim, where I can show undeniable proof of God's word being true. I can show you day one and day three creation rock, the first of the flood layers, and so much more. Um, I'll give you a couple of things here. At Grant, notice the walls are straight up and down. That's indicative of very fast formation, not slow formation. They say those walls have stood there for seven million years. Well, rock walls collapse over time. Where's the rock debris? Yeah, there's hardly any rock to bring in Grand Canyon. That's just a couple of their problems I can point out. But let me ask you an obvious question. If rivers carve out huge canyons over millions of years of time, and if the earth is billions of years old, well, why don't we have millions of Grand Canyons around the world? I mean, every river, gully, and stream should be in its own Grand Canyon by now, right? Well, the fact of the matter is the earth isn't that old. We don't know if rivers can carve out canyons, even given lots of time. See, here's a satellite photo of Grand Canyon. 
The white area is snow. It's on the Kaibab upward. The reason the canyon is so spectacular is not that it goes into the plain. It cuts through the upward. Toward the end of the flood, the mountains arose, the valley sank down, the Colorado Plateau got pushed together, forming the upward. Where these layers are lifted about 4,500 feet above the plain. That's the reason they have snow on them. They're uplifted. And the river never cut the canyon. It had nothing to do with the formation. The theories are either right at the end of the flood or perhaps there was a delay. The flood waters eventually burst through this earthen dam, carving Grand Canyon very quickly. And I cover this in our three-day formation. I also lead river raft trips through Grand Canyon and um, our bus trips, which are really great Christian tours. Here I am doing an on-the-rim talk. There's a 900-foot butte right behind me right here. It's called Cedar Butte. It's 900 feet. How many of you have been to Grand Canyon? When you were standing on the edge of the canyon looking down, there used to be a mile of strata above where you were standing. It's been removed for tens of thousands of square miles. And at Grand Canyon, which is one of the four pillars of Old Earth beliefs, guess what they tell you about that missing mile of strata? Nothing. Nothing. Because there's no way to explain it but global flood, and a global flood wipes out every Old Earth belief. But God left these two 900-foot buttes, Cedar Butte and Red Butte, at the two entrance points to the south rim. And there used to be 5,000 feet of layers on top of this. A mile of strata has been removed. And they pick them up as you go north in what's called the Grand Staircase. That's Z uh, Vermilion Cliffs, Zion, and Bryce. And we do four-day trips through that area. We call them our Grand Staircase tours. But Grand Canyon and Grand Staircase are monuments to God's global flood judgment and to God's grace and mercy. Because, my friends, that's what we all deserve. But because of God's grace and mercy, he sent a redeeming Savior who would bruise the head of the serpent to suffer and die in our place. Wow. God's judgment and his mercy seen in the world we live in. Well, the Ice Age ended, and the world was divided in the days of Peleg. We're told unto Eber were born two sons. One was Peleg, which means furrowed or divided. Well, at the Tower of Babel, God confused languages, and people spread out around the globe because ocean waters were about 400 feet lower than they are today. But during Peleg's lifetime, the cooling oceans led to less evaporation, and the Ice Age ended. And the ice caps began melting, and they filled in the oceans, dividing people by languages, nations, islands, and continents. The world was divided in the days of Peleg. In fact, this textbook says 20,000 years ago, sea level was 400 feet lower than it is today. The ice mass is melted. So there's nothing new about the ice mass is melted. Don't go out and destroy the U.S. economy because the ice caps are melting. They've been melting for 4,000 years now, my friends. Now, if the strata were laid down in a global flood, we should find sedimentary layers in a mixed order around the globe. We should find millions of fossils in those layers that were drowned and buried before they could rot away, but we shouldn't find any missing links of one kind evolving into another. We should find polystrata fossils that traverse multiple layers, carbon-14 in all the, the layers, and in the same amount from the top layer to the bottom layer, and we should find carbon-14 in coal, oil, natural gas deposits, etc. And my friends, this is exactly what is found. This isn't somewhat what is found. It's exactly what is found. And if you think you can't be scientific and believe in the biblical flood, well, you know, the geological names of periods are important for a basis of scientific study. But the only difference between the biblical view and the secular view is how long it took those layers to form and what event formed them. Might as well look at the correct view, the true view, right? That's real science. So why do secular scientists continue to deny the global flood? Well, because they're teaching it's a fact that life on Earth has evolved. And with no evidence to back up Darwinism, they have to assume this depended on an immense length of time. And my friends, a global flood wipes out every old Earth belief. Every old Earth belief and every religion based on old earth needs. Yet the majority of Christian colleges and seminaries today are teaching old earth beliefs that put death before Adam. And their misled grads are filling the church and only 2% of churches will allow me to share this information. 
while we lose 85% of our kids. So if you have people, if you know folks in other churches, start encouraging them and their pastors to see this information. And you guys are fortunate. You, you have one of those 2% of pastors here. The Bible says, teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. The Bible says don't do it. But the global flood evidence should remind us of God's past and coming judgments and his grace and mercy. Beloved, it was needful for me to exhort you that we need to earnestly contend for the faith. We need to stop the compromise and put our trust in the word of God.